Hello, good evening, and welcome to another session for Business Ethics 360. And uh, tonight, it looks like there's no one in the chat, so we'll see if someone shows up, but I'm just addressing myself to all of you on YouTube uh, so far tonight. My game plan for this evening is uh, to knock out a couple extra hanging threads with Kant, and then to really chew into as much Aristotle as we can possibly get through, maybe even doing the whole thing. That would be pretty swell. Um, but we'll see if I'm able to meet that ambition. Um, my apologies for my voice. Um, I've uh, Last two days, I went to go see my Cubs play. Um, the Mariners, they came into town last time. They've done that six years ago. So I took advantage of it, and uh, there was a lot to yell and scream at. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun, um, but my voice just got shot. There were a lot of Cubs fans uh, at, the, um, at the game, so... There was a there was a lot of enthusiasm and I definitely got cut up in it. Oh, it looks like a couple people showed up here. Um, hello and welcome. Um, please, as always, uh, feel free to jump in and ask questions and give comments as we go. Uh, the chats have been pretty thin for these. Hey, good evening. Um, chat has been pretty thin so far this year, and um, maybe that's just because everything's making sense and is going great. Um, but I always think that there's room for uh, for more of that um, and that it adds value for for everyone uh, people who are watching the video later especially um, that don't get the chance to ask questions um, and you'll see here here's a lava lamp some people are asking like what's a lava lamp well this this is a lava lamp it's wax in a glass thing that's heated with a light at the bottom and it makes cool things it's an old hippie thing uh, I had one when I was a kid, my dad's old college lava lamp, and and then I got one for my father-in-law. So anyway, this is not useful information, <laughs> um, but let's get started. So with Kant, a couple other things um, that I wanted to touch on. I've made some promises about themes that we're going to return to, especially uh, Kant and happiness. And that's the second thing I want to touch on. But the first thing I want to touch on is Kant's conception of evil or maybe the lack thereof. How Kant understands when things go wrong. And as a quick note to get started with this here, I'm going to pull up my uh, lecture notes. Um, for those of you who are in the chat tonight, you won't see this on the screen, um, but my Kant lecture notes are up in the file section of Canvas, and you can take a look at them. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube here, uh, you can see that the lecture notes are pretty long. I've got 13 pages of notes for Kant. And in fact, the last like seven pages of it is all the stuff on Kant and freedom that's in the third section section of the grounding of the metaphysics of morals. And first thing I want to say is I think this stuff is cool and interesting and um, worth understanding, uh, especially if you're concerned about the free will problem. That's a little bit outside of the mandate of what this class is all about. It's one of those bigger picture issues for ethics, like one of those gate concepts that actually doesn't matter so much for what we're up to with business ethics but it's definitely something that matters for morality writ large um, and if you're curious about it if you take a look at those notes and I'm, I'm guessing you would have questions just if, uh, taking a look at what I'm saying there um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it more uh, Kant's solution to the free will problem is really original and creative and pretty interesting but anyway um, the right before that about halfway through this is on page uh, six um, I have a section called how do we understand evil or when things go wrong what would it mean to violate the categorical imperative and um, I want to talk about this in terms of the ways in which things go right first so if you remember that roadmap we had on the board on Tuesday um, the like bubbles and everything we I described it as hunt uh, Kant hunting down I made the same mistake in my lecture this morning um, Kant hunting down where the moral law could even possibly be found and he's sort of like looking could be here could be here can't be there let's look over here okay and here it could be here or here it can't be there so it's got to be something over here and each of those moves actually gives us a clue about what you have to do for your action to have moral worth and where are the possible ways in which your action could fall off the boat and fail to have moral worth and I'm gonna use that phrase very it might sound like careful loyal lawyer speak but I'm gonna do that because to let a little bit of the cat out of the bag here 
Kant doesn't really have a robust conception of evil. It's not possible on his theory, which is actually a very interesting sort of thing about his theory. Um, but let's get to that when we get to that. But that's part of where this is going. So when I talk about things going wrong for Kant, I don't think we can say it's a matter of someone doing evil or someone acting immorally. Um, that's actually maybe not possible. Actions to have negative moral worth is not actually going to happen for Kant. Maybe, um, let, let, let me throw this out here first before I go any further. After the lecture on Tuesday, you might have noticed something about Kant's moral law, his categorical imperative, that given how he's setting this up, what it means to act morally, to do actions that have moral worth, what it means to act rationally, where reason is fully determining the action to be performed or fully determining the will, uh, and what it is to act freely. Again, back to the self-determination. For Kant, freedom is a matter of controlling your own will. That's what real freedom is. Not like the power to do what I want or something, but the ability for me to control my own will. That's what freedom is. All three of those things, acting morally, acting rationally, and acting freely, are coextensive for Kant. They all end up meaning the same thing, they, or they all end up uh, amounting to the same thing. There's no way in which one of them can be separated from the others. If you're not acting rationally, then you're not really fully determined, and you're not acting morally. You're not uh, acting in a way that's consistent with the categorical imperative. If you're not acting freely, well, that means you're not acting on reason, and you won't be acting morally either. You won't be doing an action from the categorical imperative. So wherever you pick it up with those three, the other two sort of fall off from that, which is interesting, very interesting. Um, if true, if Kant's right about this, that's pretty awesome for one big reason. There's always a question about how to uh, argue for um, acting morally. Like if someone's like, well, I know what morality is supposed to be, but why should I do it? Like, why should I care about it? Kant has some ready-made things to say that basically, well, to act anything other than moral is actually irrational. Um, and that might get some people to be like, okay, yeah, that, that gives some teeth to the criticism, right? Like, you can object to almost anything by saying that it is irrational. If you're able to show that that's the case, like that would help to explain why it would be wrong to do that, right? If, it, if it's not rational. Um, but it also might be uh, that Kant's got a really incredible weapon here at his disposal by a, the appeal to freedom. Because people that want to do immoral actions usually think they want to be able to choose those things. And Kant's saying something surprising here by saying like, actually, it's not you who's actually choosing something if you do something that fails to have moral worth. So there's that phrase again. So let's go to uh, how could things go wrong for Kant. And we'll, we'll see a little bit of an argument for the claims I just made on his behalf of like things Kant is going to end up saying. Here's part of the reason why. So go back to the map, all right? All the different ways that action can happen. Actions at the top, right? And we had all these different mechanisms whereby the will can get determined. Kant describes, uh, so positively, in order for my action, this is kind of a recap from Tuesday, in order for my action to have moral worth, I have to do it from a self-generated law. It has to be done from reason. Um, the action gets its moral worth based on the rule that I was acting on that led me to do that, my intention, my purpose, my goal, my end, uh, and arrive that where that end is set by some rule or maxim I give to myself, that I represent to myself through the capacity of reason. The second condition, though, is that it has to be done from a categorical imperative instead of a hypothetical imperative. And then it had to do with respecting the categorical imperative. So the, the respect for reason is also important. You remember me talking about how just because I'm going to think of a rule doesn't mean I'm going to follow it. If I think the rule, but I don't respect the rule, then it won't actually end up determining my will at all. Um, I think I used a silly example of something like, maybe I'm mixing this up with my other class, but like uh, I could represent to myself the maxim that says, uh, next time someone says the word purple, start taking off all your clothes. And I was like, I can think of that rule, but if someone says purple, I'm not going to start taking off my clothes because I don't respect that rule. I don't think that that rule has authority uh, to determine my will. So respect is the other kind of key component here. So all the ways that things can go wrong for Kant derive from those positive conditions not being met. 
So let's explain and describe what those would actually look like. Um, those of you in the chat, how are things going so far? Any any questions with all the kind of recapping and stuff that I've done so far? While you guys are doing that, I'm going to grab a, a thinking about if you have any questions. I'm going to actually grab a, a whiteboard so I can do some drawing. All good? Marika, Theo, Leticia, all, all doing okay? Cool. All right. So, got a little whiteboard here and a marker. So, think about an action here. So, And is this is the uh, video flipped for any of you? Is it mirrored? You can read what I'm saying. Okay, awesome. So here's an action I'm thinking about doing. And the first thing that Kant said was, the action has to be done from reason. But he also talked about how self-generated laws aren't the only thing that control our will. It's also um, uh, laws of inclination. So if I have inclinations here, that are just causing me to do this action directly, what that would represent is something like unreflective action, that I'm just acting without thinking. I'm just following impulses kind of blindly. So that's the first way things could go wrong. That would be, you know, problem case number one, it would be just like unreflective thinking. I'm not even engaging reason when I'm thinking about what to do. The second possibility though, would be I engage reason and, but I only think, uh, I only give myself maxims that are hypothetical in their character. If you remember, hypothetical maxims always have this conditional structure. They say do something for the sake of something else. So if I've got a hypothetical imperative in here, the hypothetical imperative is directing me to do this action, but on the basis of something else. So it's kind of like there's this hanging thread here. Um, I used an example in my other class uh, earlier today was like, uh, do you think it's good to come to class? Uh, so those of you who are in the chat, I mean, those of you watching on YouTube, there's probably some good reasons why you're not here. but um, Or maybe not. I don't know. But for those of you in the chat, you're like, why did you come tonight? And uh, there's probably going to be some reason for that. Um, when I was talking to my on-campus students yesterday, or to, earlier today, you know, they could be like, attendance credit. And why is that good? Why is it good to get the attendance credit? Well, it could be for something else. So you can imagine there being, you know, more hypothetical imperatives here. They're, and they could keep, you know, having this going quite a while. There could be a chain of hypothetical reasoning here. So you want to get the attendance credit. Why do you want the attendance credit? So that I can pass the class. Why do you want to pass the class? Why well, I need the credits to be able to graduate. Why do you want to graduate? Because I need the degree to be able to get a better job and blah, blah, blah. It just keeps going, right? Um, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But eventually, if you're actually going to do that action, something needs to be uh, ultimately grounding that. And that's, I'm using Kant's language explicitly here, grounding from metaphysics of morals. Um, this, these hypothetical imperatives just pass the buck on why you're doing what you're doing. And eventually, ideally, these hypothetical imperatives would terminate in a categorical imperative, in which case everything's kosher. And that's totally fine. Like, this is actually what we want. Kant doesn't think hypothetical imperatives are evil or wrong or bad. Just that they aren't sufficient to determine the action all by themselves. If we're only using hypothetical imperatives, then reason's not fully determining the end. But that something like this would be uh, how ideal action would work is stands to reason. Since, take, take something like the um, third formulation of the categorical imperative from Tuesday. The one that says respect all people as intrinsically valuable. Well, I might be like, okay, I recognize that's my duty. But what does that mean for me right now in this situation dealing with you? Like if I was asking myself this question, I'm like, I respect all people thanks to the categorical imperative. Like I want to follow that. So that means I respect my students. But what does it mean for me to operate in this lecture or in my interactions with you in a way that's respectful of your intrinsic value? How would that actually look? Why would it lead me to do one thing versus another thing? Well, I'm going to need hypothetical imperatives to tell me that. Like, if I know I'm supposed to respect you, 
the hypothetical impaired is, well, well, if respect, then do this, under, if, it, if it's these circumstances, and, and for this sake, for that, you know, do it in that way. So uh, we'll always need something like hypothetical imperatives to translate the universal claim of the categorical imperative to a particular action in a particular situation. But it's still ultimately informed by the categorical imperative. And each one of these links would have to itself pass the test of the categorical imperative of being able to universalize them without contradiction in order for them to be grounded on the categorical imperative. Uh, the picture I, I gave at the beginning of class on Tuesday with like a universal rule that's good unconditionally then sets the context for understanding things that are more contingently good. You know, like this, going down and down. That's what's happening here. So that's what ideally should happen. But how could it go wrong? Well, I could be engaging reason, but I don't think of a categorical imperative to ground all my hypothetical reasoning. I'm using reasoning, but it's not ultimately justified on the categorical imperative, in which case it's got to be grounded on something. What could that something be? If it's not going to be reason itself, the only other option here are more inclinations. And we talked about this scenario a little bit. So this, is, this would be case number two, where instead of just acting uh, impulsively, I reflect on my action. But the ultimate thing that's driving all of my reasoning is just following some inclination or desire or some instinct, something like that. We talked about this uh, on Tuesday as like the possibility of how uh, inclinations can hijack the reasoning process, how I might be engaging reason, but with bias uh, or with um, ulterior motives or that I'm just rationalizing something. One of my students in the earlier class today brought up Bernie Madoff, um, the uh, pyramid scheme um, uh, uh, hedge fund manager. Uh, you probably have heard of him before, scandals around his unethical behavior. And um, they were, the, the student brought it up because of some stuff I'm going to explore later here. About when I was saying Kant's going to say that if you're acting morally, then you have to be acting rationally. And so if you're not acting morally, you're actually being irrational. And they were like, well, Bernie Madoff seemed pretty rational to me. He's really smart. And he's like, he definitely thought through this pyramid scheme plan at great detail. And I'm like, yeah, totally. Kant wouldn't disagree with that. Because for Kant, it's not like if you're educated or intelligent or have rational capacities, that reason is always going to be determining your action. You might be, I, I said, um, Kant would probably say Bernie Madoff is clever, but not rational. He's not being rational when he puts this horrible exploitive scheme to work to try to basically take people's money um, in, a, in an uh, unjust way. Um, he's really doing a whole lot of careful, rational thinking, but on hypothetical imperatives that are really just rationalizing and extending in an intelligent way his underlying greed and the, the inclinations of selfishness here. Because for Kant, there's no way for me to respect my own good and not respect other people's good, not without contradicting my own will, where I give myself the categorical imperative to act on. Um, to do anything else is not going to be done from me, it's not going to be done from reason, and it's not going to be moral. So that's case number two. I engage reason, but only via hypothetical imperatives, in which case inclinations are picking up the slack of how this is going to be ultimately grounded to be motivated to do the action. Uh, passing the buck until it's either grounded on a categorical imperative or an inclination. So if it's not going to be this, it'll be this. The third case is also kind of interesting. Um, I kind of have this feeling like, like when we were talking about Bernie Madoff earlier today, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if Bernie Madoff even thought about the categorical imperative. I think he might really be uh, just driven by his desires and uh, is not even batting an eye or considering whether his actions are universalizable without contradiction or something like that. Um, but Kant actually, I, so maybe a lot of action is like that. A lot of the things people do that fail to have moral worth would be in that category. But Kant actually says it's the third category that he thinks is the most common case of moral wrongdoing. And this is a case where I engage reason, and I even get to the categorical imperative. I consider it. 
I, I am aware of it. In the second case, I'm not, right? I'm just like rationalizing the whole time. But in the third case, I do recognize what my duty is. I know what would be fair and right. Um, I know what my obligations are, that kind of stuff. I know, I recognize how I need to respect people, and yet I choose not to follow it. How could that be explained? Well, it's not a failure of reason in the sense of like, reason got to the considerations that we like dug deep enough on the whys to figure out like, what is the right grounding for all this? But Kant says in this case, it's because I don't respect reason that I don't act on it. And what could sort of draw me away from respecting reason? Well, it can't be reason itself. Reason can't legislate its own disrespect. We've talked about that on Tuesday too. So again, it would have to be inclinations. Or in other words, temptations. I recognize what I ought to do, but I'm like, oh, but I really want that. And Kant describes this as a situation where I recognize the universal rule, but I create an exception for myself in the in the current circumstance. It's kind of like, um, actually, I get this a lot. I get plagiarism every quarter. Please, no one in this class plagiarize your final paper. It sucks to have to deal with that. I don't want to fail you, blah, 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 blah. But I, it happens almost every quarter, um, at least one case, unfortunately, sad to say. And when I talk to students and have those tough conversations, they're like, they know what they're doing. They know it's wrong. It's not... I, maybe I've had a couple of students in 10 years of teaching that didn't know what plagiarism was and I wasn't like, you're bullshitting me. Or I'm like, oh, you sincerely just didn't understand that or didn't understand that expectation, which is surprising. It's on the syllabus. Maybe they didn't read the syllabus. I don't know. Um, but most of them know what they're doing is wrong, but they're just like, and sometimes like last quarter I had like three students plagiarize. They're the last students I thought were going to plagiarize. They were always engaged. They were diligent. They were interested. They were enthusiastic. They talked to me after class, like all this stuff. It was so sad. But what happened for them was they were like, it was getting late in the quarter, and they were desperate. They really wanted to succeed at the class. They had doubts about their ability to do this legitimately. They were running out of time. And so they broke the rule. They made an exception to deal with their present circumstances. But they still knew what they were doing, right? So this would be this kind of a case. But in all of these cases... It's inclinations that are ultimately determining the action, not reason. All of the cases of how actions could fail to have moral worth come down to inclinations driving things. And like we talked about on Tuesday, for Kant, acting on inclinations is like the way in which we're like boulders and not people. Where we're not in control of our actions, but our actions, our wills, are being determined by causal forces that we didn't decide on, that we don't necessarily endorse, that might even be happening without our recognition of them. And in as much as that's happening, like remember we talked about the, the boulder case. We don't think boulders are immoral. They are just affected and maybe to do things that ultimately have tragic consequences or results, but are themselves not subject to blame. So this is weird. People are subject to causal forces like inclinations that determine their will, and yet we also have this capacity for reason. So how do we decide the extent to which people are morally responsible? That's really tough. One of the implications of this view, I think, um, in reading Kant is that any time you're acting immorally, it's not really you who's acting, in which case you're just an amoral thing. You're just a boulder tumbling down a hill. You can't actually choose deliberately to act rationally. You can't do it. Uh, or, I'm sorry, to act immorally, to violate the categorical imperative. The only way you have the power of being self-determining is because of the capacity of reason. And reason can't legislate anything that's logically contradictory, that violates the categorical imperative. So you actually can't intend to do evil. You might be thinking about it like reasons engaged, right, in a rationalizing function, um, but you can't choose it, not through reason. It wouldn't be reason that's determining your will in those cases. So that's why I think for Kant, there really isn't immoral action. There's just actions with moral worth and actions that fail to have moral worth. Um, sometimes students, and this happened in my class earlier today, are disturbed by this. They think Kant must be doing something wrong. This is an absurd result. And I think part of the, the pressure there is that um, we think, oh, well, this just this makes everyone off the hook of accountability. The same way that we use the like insanity defense in the legal system. Where it's like, if you weren't in control of your actions, then you can't be held accountable for them. Um, I don't think that's the result that's going to happen with Kant, though. 
because even if you can't intentionally choose evil, you can't intend to do something bad, um, you, could, you cannot determine your will in such a way, um, there still is always this moral obligation and mandate to not do that, to act in a self-determined way. So the accountability is always there, and it's actually there every time you will anything at all. When you will any action or make any judgment that something is good or worth doing, you're legislating the categorical imperative to yourself in that moment. So uh, there's no like escaping from that, in other words. There's no grounds for making excuses to let yourself off the hook. Um, and in terms of everyone else's obligations towards respecting you as a person, they're going to be trying to encourage you to be self-determining and help you develop your capacity to be rational. Um, we got into some tangents earlier today, too, about punishment here. I definitely think there's room for punishment on a Kantian ethic. Uh, we talked a little bit about, on Tuesday, about interventionary use of force um, and how you uh, respecting people's autonomy doesn't always mean letting them do whatever they want. If they're not acting in a self-determined way, you don't have to respect those choices because that's not choices they're actually making. Um, I, I'm sorry for the noise. I'm going to pause the video and check in for a little bit. I'll be right back. Oh, sorry about that. Someone doesn't want to go to bed. Um, so we were talking on Tuesday, to pick up where I left off, um, we were talking on Tuesday about how I think for Kant it can be justifiable to uh, step in the way of someone's will. Um, I'm sub in, under normal circumstances, respecting people for Kant really does mean respecting their autonomy, respecting their choices. When someone chooses to do something uh, freely, for me to say, no, you can't do that, I'm taking that power away from you, is wrong. Um, that is a, a violation of the third formulation of the categorical imperative, along with the other two as well, um, about universalizing maxims. But when people are not acting on reason, then uh, violating their will doesn't involve any disrespect for their reason. And, and if it's done from a point of trying to promote their agency or their ability to be self-determining, then those actions can be justified. Remember, again for Kant, the action's justification comes from why it's being done. And if the ultimate reason is a respect for other people, then that's what can be justified. I use this example of um, with addiction. So... Um, Say I have a friend who's an alcoholic. I've actually had lots of friends who are alcoholics. It's kind of strange. Um, but let's say I want to ship them off to a rehab center. And if my reason for doing so is like, I'm sick of their shit and I don't want to have to deal with them anymore, then that's not an action that can be justified on the categorical imperative. That's based on me basically using what happens to them as a means for my own happiness. Uh, and that's not just. But if I'm doing it, I'm getting in the way of their will, um, purposefully for the sake of them recovering from the addiction which is a condition which inhibits their agency and their ability to be self-determining then to do that action is actually out of respect for them remember I said on Tuesday that for Kant everyone has moral worth this respect for persons to treat people as intrinsically valuable um, is something I have to do with everybody unconditionally and it's not dependent on the extent to which someone is rational, but just their capacity for it. So if I'm going to act paternalistically for Kant, the only way that that can be justified, the sort of fringe case for that, normally paternalism wrong, except in cases where the person is not self-determining and the actions that would be paternalistic are not done for their benefit in terms of happiness or anything like that, um, not like your parents making admonishments to you about your lifestyle practices, um, but it has to be done for the sake of promoting their ability to choose for themselves. I really like parents and children as another example of this, that children are not yet capable of being self-determining. They're still building that capacity, and that's why parents rightfully have the, according to Kant, um, the power and the authority and the mandate to make choices on their behalf, like medical decisions, certain lifestyle decisions, and things like that, to try to develop and nurture them. But the dream of every, I would say, good parent, <laughs> maybe that's a little of this, that, of, would be to have your children grow up in such a way that they don't need you to be making their decisions for them, that they can operate independently as their own agents, uh, freely and be self-determining and self-sufficient and that kind of thing. And that's the dream here, too, for... Um, any kind of interventionary use of force or punishment or stuff like that.
Kant has a lot of stuff about why he hates lying. And I think this is interesting. A lot of people are like, no, I'm willing to tell lies for, for a greater good. Uh, like um, the classic example is like in Nazi Germany, you're hiding Jews in your attic to keep them from the Nazis and the concentration camps. And the Nazis knock on your front door and they're like, you got any Jews hiding inside? Uh, can you lie to them? Most people are like, yeah, you should lie to them. Kant famously says, nope. I mean, that's anachronistic because he was before the Nazis. But those kinds of situations, he's saying you can't lie for any reason at all. I think there's probably a way to justify it. But I, I'm not bringing this up to like nitpick with Kant over lying. I'm bringing this up because at least Kant's explanation for why he takes such a hard stance on lying, while I don't think it's ultimately effective in making it a categorical wrong, is still an interesting illustration of what it looks like to respect people and their autonomy. And what Kant says is that when you lie to a person, you're actually violating their ability to be a self-governing agent because now they don't have the information that they need to be able to make the choice for themselves. When you lie to a person to manipulate their choices, you're basically making their choice for them. You're taking their agency away. And if that sounds a little familiar, uh, it might be familiar to you because there's one arena in which we definitely respect that. Although I think in a lot of other ways we don't, I haven't heard a lot of people with moral intuitions like Kant's. Um, in one case, we do seem to be on his page and that's with medical decisions. We think it's uh, wrong for a doctor to withhold information to their patient that would inform a choice about what procedures to, to undergo or, or what treatment to be given because without being fully informed, you can't really make uh, a intelligent, uh, authentic, autonomous choice. So the respect for people's autonomy requires giving them the information that they need to be able to make a rational decision to exert that function, to perform that capacity. So that gets a, maybe a little vision here of what, what Kant has in mind. Um, so that was, that was how things go wrong and why Kant thinks evil can't happen, which uh, on the one hand is uh, kind of like optimistic, I think. I mean, it's interesting that it actually is metaphysically impossible for anyone to intentionally choose evil. There's something almost heartwarming about that. But it also doesn't take all the bite out of um, moral atrocity and, tr and the depth of moral wrongdoing. Um, because, you know, sometimes we're disturbed by the idea of evil people, like horror movies are full of this kind of stuff, like right? characters who are fully in command and choose to do evil, right? Um, but Kant says such a thing is impossible. So it doesn't take the bite out of the way in which those humans are disturbing. Like... I'm honestly, I am very disturbed by Hitler. Hitler is a kind of cartoon often these days. It's like far enough in history, there's enough distance on it. But I've studied a lot of World War II history. Um, I've studied a lot about the Nazis. As an old film student, I watched, uh, um, uh, what is it, Triumph of the Will, a famous Nazi propaganda movie about Hitler. And he, it, he is genuinely terrifying to me as a person. But I think the, the, um, the horror that we have at what people do when, we, when you like hear something on the news, you're like, how could someone do this? How could they be a human and make this choice? It's not so much about how someone could intentionally choose to do this stuff. Kant says that's impossible. But it's a different kind of disturbingness. And it's a disturbingness about how badly we can be dug into a hole a circumstantial hole with our inclinations where we our reason is so co-opted we're so um, unable to be self-governing that it leads us to do actions like that I think that's what's really disturbing here um, even with Kant's thing about you can't be evil like the disturbingness of immoral action really gets at the disturbing vulnerability that our wills have to causal forces rather than to our own intentions. The kind of powerlessness or the, the fragility of our ability to exert this self-determining capacity that we all have universally. I think that's what's, what's really the disturbing part about immoral action or when we're like, how can someone do that? It's, it's really about like the depth of hell that a person can be in. I mean, really for Kant, people who do immoral actions are not objects of resentment, but objects of pity. That their ability to uh, manifest the dignity of being a person 
is not happening. And that's actually why they are, you could argue, even more deserving of our care and concern. And that the third formulation of the categorical imperative, which says we have to treat everyone, including terrible criminals, as intrinsically valuable, might start making a little bit more sense. But those are still big claims and definitely controversial. They cut against a lot of people's moral intuitions. But uh, if you want to debate that stuff more, I'd be happy to. Um, the final thing that I wanted to get on with Kant, let me know if you got any questions, people, in the chat. But the final thing that I definitely need to touch on that I promised that we got to do is to return to this topic of happiness. And I can do this very quickly. At this point, it's probably clear that for Kant, I mean, you can tell what he, what he means when he says, the, in his view, the purpose of morality is not to make people happy. It's to make them good, for them to have goodwill, um, to exist in a good state, which is, for Kant, a kind of self-determination and freedom, acting rationally, um, and at the same time, acting in accordance with their moral duty. To have a will that chooses the good, unconditionally. That is the purpose of morality, for Kant. But, he says, um, there, while the, the um, maxim that tells you to be concerned about the happiness of others and your own happiness is not a primary duty, it is a secondary duty. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, man, my voice is starting to go. Let's see if I can survive the night. Um, let me draw you another picture. So... I've described the categorical imperative and Kant's whole theory here as not an exhaustive account of morality. It doesn't answer all of our questions, especially in this stuff about how even if you know the universal law, you still need to figure out which contingent actions would be in charge of it. And I can demonstrate that or, or depict it by talking about the categorical imperative as like setting this hard fence on what actions could even possibly be morally permissible. Anything out here that violates the categorical imperative, right out. There's no way that's the right thing to do. Things like slavery, rape is a really good example, using another person as a means for, for your own ends. These things are just categorically wrong for Kant. And he puts lying in there too, although I don't think that's quite right. But there's all these things, anything that violates the categorical imperative is totally unjustified. But there's a lot of space within here for like talking about contingent goods, contingent goods that are sometimes good, sometimes bad, but, you know, valuing them is not inconsistent with the categorical imperative. It, it can be universalized without contradiction. And a lot of happiness stuff is here. But I do think, I might have said this before, I think the hard limit of the categorical imperative, while it leaves some of this stuff undefined, still exerts some pressure on what that contingent space of value should look like. And I think that happens with happiness. And let's see how it works. So Kant has two arguments for why um, being concerned about other people's happiness is a secondary duty. The first is a kind of obvious thing um, that might feel like a cheap shot. Kant says, well, the one reason why you can't do things that make people unhappy or that harm them is that you could never universalize a maxim that told you to do that without contradiction. So it's like, treat others how you want to be treated. Like, There's no way in which just going around and purposely trying to make people's lives a living hell is something that you could ever end up universalizing without a contradiction, probably in your will, if you remember the distinction between contradiction in thought and contradiction in will. It's probably going to be in that second category. But it's the second argument that I find really interesting. Kant says, well, the other reason why you can't do it is that it violates the third formulation of categorical imperative, in that it's not promoting people's ability to be self-determining. He says, when people are unhappy, they're more likely to not do their duty. So you want to try to promote their happiness out of respect for their ability to be autonomous and to follow reason and the moral law and all that kind of stuff. That if they're unhappy, that's going to not make it impossible for them to act in a self-determined way, but it makes it harder. I, I've told some stories about my brother. It's actually his birthday today, so um, I guess it's appropriate for me to tell a story about him. But I told you about how he like ran hot. And when I was a kid, I was like very cool. I wanted to be the adult. And my brother would always try to like get my goat. So he'd just like poke me and poke me until I freaked out and didn't act in a self-determining way because he's creating an unpleasant experience in me. That in a microcosm is what Kant's talking about. That it's wrong for my, my brother can't get me to give up my Kantian dignity. Like theoretically, I could just take it or take some other course of action that doesn't involve getting angry at him, hitting him or something like that. 
but that's what he was going for. He And he can't do it directly, but what he can do is he can put obstacles in my path of being self-determining, making it harder and harder and harder to do it. I think there's a lot of people in this country today that experience this. People who are um, not as privileged, who are more socially disenfranchised. People aren't directly violating their dignity, but there's all these things about how society works that are like little slow like pokes, like little things that just make it harder and harder to operate with goodwill with people. Um, and that's wrong for things to go that way. This is another reason why I talked about Kant and care last time and where I kind of weave this care ethics into Kant that respecting people's autonomy can't be a hands-off thing. Kant's like, if we're respecting people's ability to be self-determining and that we're trying to promote that uh, and value them as, as an object of value, intrinsically and unconditionally so, then we do have obligations, I think. I Maybe I should turn this. But I think Kant does give us the mandate for why we need to be in each other's business more in a way that's supportive and caring to try to promote each other's ability and support each other's ability to be empowered and self-determining. Um, Kant's theory gives a really good basis for that. Um, <clears throat> I think I might have mentioned before that there's a, a lot of care ethics by feminists. Um, it's almost called feminist care ethics. Uh, it's like a newer movement. Um, and sometimes it has this like backlash against more traditional moral theories like the ones we're studying on the grounds that they're like privileging masculine virtues rather than uh, feminine ones, um, but I've I've met a couple feminists. Um, I have an article saved that I just, as someone who thinks Kant is compelling, I was like, felt good to hear someone else say it that was also not a man, that was a woman. But she was like, I don't know why feminists are trying to like throw Kant in the trash. He's really really important for giving a, a meta ethical justification for why these values that are so central to the feminist project. Uh, are objectively and universally and unconditionally morally right to do so. Um, this like urgency about promoting people's ability to be self-determining and not just being like, do what you want. Whenever you're going to be self-determining, cool. I just won't interfere with you, right? I'll, but I'll do my own things that might make it harder for you to do what you want to do or something like that. But I, I think Kant really does require uh, and demand with this categorical imperative extended to happiness um, a, a kind of way in which we're more involved with each other and trying to support each other and empower each other. Okay. And there's a fourth formulation of the categorical imperative. I'm not going to get to it um, because we're going to do Rawls. And Rawls is kind of uh, maybe a more nuanced and developed version of Kant's fourth categorical imperative, which is really about social justice. Like what we've been talking about this mostly on the standpoint of an individual. And then with the third formulation, interpersonally, like how we treat others. In the fourth one, it's all about what does a just community look like given Kant's ethical principles? So those are the hanging threads I wanted to get to. Did it in 43 minutes, boom. Um, so that's gonna leave some more time here for Aristotle. But I wanna check in with the chat and see um, how things are going and, and then maybe take a break and then we'll come back and start digging into some Aristotle. Um, how are we doing chat? Any any questions popping up uh, immediately that you wanna ask now? And, and I'll ask again after the break too, but anything that you've got on the tip of your tongue? Haven't seen any questions so far. Cool. Most of the, the questions you had, Marika? Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to pause the video here and we'll, we'll take a little break and then I'll check in chat with you when, uh, when I get back here too. Okay. We're back. Um, so for the remainder of the, the video lecture tonight, I'm going to be talking about Aristotle and virtue ethics. And there's a few preliminary things I do want to talk about. One is, uh, why talk about virtue ethics for our class? Um, one, it's, it's kind of one of the, the other big historical like ways or not even historical but just like of the logically possible ways there are of approaching ethics and deciding how you ought to act virtue ethics has been one of the biggies in in history and also contemporarily there's kind of a little renaissance going on right now in philosophy for virtue ethics so much so that um 
it started filtering into other areas of philosophy too, especially epistemology, the study of knowledge. Um, and we talk about intellectual virtues now. Um, I might have mentioned gaslighting in passing at some point in conversation. And um, there's been a lot of philosophers talking about this gaslighting phenomenon recently as like a way in which you do epistemic injustice to another person. But the antidote is often talked about as having these intellectual virtues. And the code of intellectual conduct is actually itself an articulation of those traits of character that are ideal for a certain type of activity or a way of being in as much as we are knowers or doing this project of rational truth seeking um, and debate. So uh, it's very prominent. It's also really prominent in the business world. Uh, I sometimes relate this to uh, sports. I don't know how many of you uh, follow sports or like sports uh, or much less like do things like watch post game interviews with athletes and coaches and stuff like that. But the, the rhetoric that sports people, sports professionals almost always are talking in is a virtue ethic kind of framework. Uh, Russell Wilson, quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, is one of the most notorious examples of this. He's just like a fountain of virtue ethic platitudes all the time um, when you see him in interviews. And, and he's more than just an athlete. I'm sure he has a, plenty of other thoughts as a person and is articulate in other ways. But when it comes to sports interviews, it's just nonstop virtue ethics. And this happens in the business world too, of like, what kinds of traits and characteristics and habits um, should you be cultivating in yourself or for this like self-development in order to be effective in business or be a good business person, right? What are those traits that you need to have? Um, so there's a lot of this kind of language that shows up. And also, uh, and on its own, just the concept of virtue, which is really just the discussion of good and bad character traits, is something that every moral theory is going to need to have. So I always like to kind of um, clarify something that um, when we talk about virtue ethics, we could be seeing it as like another alternative to like a consequentialist or utilitarian point of view or this deontic thing that Kant is up to with rights and obligations and some things being absolutely impermissible and other things being permissible. Um, virtue ethics is another way to maybe think about a foundation for ethics, um, but it, the concept of virtue itself is going to be ubiquitous. Even if a theory isn't putting virtue on this pedestal as like the main center thing that the ethic revolves around, um, there's after whatever they do put on that pedestal, the next natural question will be, what do we have to be like in order to fulfill that moral principle or more, live that moral value? or manifest that moral vision. And I can, uh, we've talked about this in passing a couple times, like with utilitarianism, if you wanted to be a good utilitarian, there's some character traits you should really be working on. You need to be very informed about the world and how it works. So like understanding what you can predict about the consequences that will attach to certain actions, that's pretty important. You need to have a heck of a lot of empathy to be able to understand other people and how they might have different preferences than you do, to be able to pick up on that with the people that you're engaging with, to be able to respect and understand and factor in their preference satisfaction, their utility is gonna be very important. Um, having a uh, imagination for what are the other possible options to consider. Uh, and even things like what your own preferences are going to be. Like we talked about how if you have a preference for sadism, that's not going to maximize utility as much as if you have preferences to take joy in other people's happiness. Um, that's going to generate m way more situations in which utility can be maximized. So um, that that would be some ex some quick examples of how what virtue is going to look like for a utilitarian. Also, definitely for the utilitarian, the character trait of being willing to detach from your own self-interest to consider other people. Because there's many situations in which in order to maximize utility, you're going to have to at least hold back a little bit on your own, maximizing your own utility um, to maybe maybe even make some significant sacrifices for the sake of that um, to consider what happens to others. Um, considerateness, you know, that, that'll be a thing too. 
Um, for Kant, it's a little more complicated because of how much he's saying, like, the moral worth of the action doesn't depend on your character. Like, inclinations are parts of your character. But Kant still has, a, I'd say, a kind of negative conception of virtue in the sense that you want to have a character that doesn't have these big distractions to acting on reason, um, to try to resist uh, strong desires, obsessions, biases, um, and over-concern for the self, the, like detachment from the self will be pretty important. Um, and also another really big virtue for Kant, and Kant talks a good deal of virtue in his writings, um, not as much in the grounding, but in his critique of practical reason, which is his like really big ethics book. Um, he talks quite a lot about virtue. But the other really big one for him would be the character trait of respecting reason. Because if you don't respect reason, you're not going to follow what it recommends. So that's going to be really important. Um, okay, but so every every moral theory, as soon as it says, this is what's the ultimate end of morality, here are the ultimate guiding principles, then it's still like, how do I make myself into a person who can fulfill that? And that would be to think about virtue. So um, I'm going to be presenting Aristotle's version of virtue ethics, um, and some of it is going to be like an alternative ethical theory. But in other ways, uh, you can kind of plug this stuff into other things too. And like I was saying, you don't have to like go all or nothing on these theories. Like you can take little bits and pieces. Like maybe it's capturing a good part of the moral landscape, but the other theories are contributing something as, uh, good as well. Another big reason for thinking that this is likely, even with Aristotle's priority on ethics uh, as virtue as the center of his ethics, is that um, Aristotle is really actually not that ambitious in his uh, theory. And to explain that, let's go back to my distinction between what I called moral worth, moral status, and then what I was calling virtue. And I called it virtue really out of deference to Aristotle's theory. So we had these, these three categories of normative judgments. And the stuff about moral worth is, again, as a quick reminder, uh, judgments about whether a person is deserving of care and concern. A moral status is evaluating a person or making a judgment about their relative guilt or innocence of wrongdoing. So this is about moral responsibility. And then virtue is, is just about whether someone has good or bad characteristics. Having good or bad characteristics doesn't necessarily mean you're responsible for them. And it may not have anything to do with whether or not you're deserving of care and concern. Um, you don't have to make those links. And Aristotle really doesn't. Um, he's really just focused around this. And he ignores these. So this is a little change of pace. Like, Kant and Mill are really concerned about this stuff. Right? Um, the egalitarianism is a part of this moral worth thing. And the moral principles that they're providing are about how you, you know, what, what your moral status is going to depend on, especially for Kant, right? Kant is really concerned about moral responsibility and whether it's you that's acting versus actions that you are not responsible for and in, in some ways not subject to criticism about um, in the sense that you're like acting like a boulder like we were talking about today. But Aristotle just doesn't really go here. And I, when I've taught Aristotle in the past, sometimes students have very strong reactions against him. Some people love him. They're like, this is the theory that made the most sense to me. But I always have some students who are like, this seems really bad and very elitist. And I, I think Aristotle is an elitist. I think that's fair. Um, I don't think his theory requires that. But him personally, he's pretty clearly from his writings somewhat judgmental. <laughs> but but that, can be, that can be detached from the, the virtue ethic. But in the way in which people think it's a necessary component is that they think or extrapolate that what Aristotle is saying about virtue somehow informs these other two judgments. And what I'm saying is, no, that's not happening in the theory. That's just not its ambition. It's not what's going on here. And a really good demonstration of this happens very early on in the Nicomachean Ethics, which is the text that um, we're working with for understanding Aristotle's virtue ethic. And right at the way he starts the discussion is he's talking about politics. Uh, not in the sense that we would use that word, sort of. Um, but for Aristotle, like a lot of ancient Greek philosophers, politics is a kind of activity. It's a kind of uh, thing that you could be skilled in. It's, it's almost like a craft. 
and in line with a lot of other people at this time, Aristotle thinks that the function of being a good politician is to make people good. And basically, in your position as leader, or any way in which you are able to influence or determine how society is going to be set up, if you're good at doing that, you're good at creating an environment in which people become better. Whether that's just meeting their basic needs, or it's things like virtue, developing good character. Um, the art of politics is making people good, making them have good lives, contributing to that. Maybe not all by itself, but doing what you can to support and encourage that. And so Aristotle says, if that's the point of politics, which everyone in ancient Athens is really concerned about because of their pseudo-democracy, um, co somewhat compromised democracy, but still a step in the democratic direction from something like authoritarian dictators or kings or something like that, um, he, uh, he's saying, if that's the art of it, then we need to figure out what, what's a good person. What does a good life look like? What is the good life? That's really the question of virtue ethics, is what is an example of human life at its very best? There's an ancient Greek word called eudaimonia, and it's been translated as happiness, and that's a bit of a misnomer. The, some of the earlier translations in English translated eudaimonia as happiness, and that, that doesn't fit, because Aristotle's not interested in a conception of happiness that's like pleasure or preference satisfaction or anything like that. It's not enjoyment or a certain feeling that you have about life. It's a state of being. Eudaimonia is a state of being. There's a, a modern uh, Aristotle scholar. I really like her translation of the Nicomachean Ethics. I think her name is Bradley, but I'm I'm a terrible academic. I'm, I think I'm misremembering her name. Um, Susan is her first name. I know I remember that. Um, but in in the preface preface to her translation, she says, uh, "Think of eudaimonia as someone who is eudaimon, is this like praiseworthy person? You just got to get up and clap." She says they're, they're judged to be, if they're eudaimon, they are judged to be an example of human life at its very best. So when you think about like role models, people that you're like, oh man, I, I want to be like that. A lot of modern virtue ethics does that kind of thing. It, it's kind of based on an epistemology, of, a moral epistemology of role models that are intuitively recognized, like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or or um, Mother Teresa or, you know, people like that, that are like, you just, you see how good they are. And they're like, they're living life the way it's supposed to be lived. And then you try to emulate their characteristics. It's the, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Philosophy, if you want to sum it up like super bluntly. Um, that's what a lot of modern virtue ethics looks like. We're doing Aristotle rather than those pictures because those modern theories, I think, are a little weak on the justification. And Aristotle actually gives a much more robust grounding of how you get a really particular view of what virtue actually is. Um, and I, I kind of uh, always think that modern virtue ethicists could stand to maybe reconnect with Aristotle a little bit because of how much he's trying to shoulder burden of proof in a more robust way than just being like, you know it when you see it kind of thing. Because uh, we can have disagreements about that, right? Like different cultures have different heroes and heroines. Um, they have different models of people that they look up to, how do we figure out those differences of disagreement of like which character traits really are ideal and which ones are not. And Aristotle gives us something to work with there that's a little bit more theoretically robust and you'll see that by the end of the video tonight. Um, so those are some preliminaries here about Aristotle, why we're studying him, and how to approach what what's happening here. So uh, in trying to figure out what are the traits of a good human life, we're not necessarily being judgmental in the sense of whether a person has is responsible for this or not, uh, like uh, or whether their their worth, their moral worth, whether they're deserving of care and concern, is contingent on their ability to be good or to have these useful or admirable characteristics. Aristotle's just not going to go there, and we can talk about that. Uh, we could see like where would that go or should that go. Um, but one thing that's kind of very telling here, Aristotle doesn't believe everyone can be eudaimon. But not because some people are just shitty or something, not like it's in their nature uh, or that they deserve it or something like that. It's really just that those ideal conditions 
um, don't always happen. So as we're going to see, some of it depends on what you're doing, but some of it also depends on what the world is contributing. And there are a lot of, uh, like an ideal form of human life, some people aren't able to live, not because of any fault of their own, but because of tragedy of circumstances. So that might actually inform what kind of moral theory we'd want to take on a virtue ethic. But the way Aristotle's thinking about it is first you got to figure out what's good first. Right? That's that's square one. What is the what's the dream? You know, like we talk about the American dream. Like what's the life that is truly ideal and to be sought after? And then we can talk about what happens with the fact that not everyone can achieve it. Or what could we do, right? Like the art of politics. Like what could we do to set up circumstances where more people can live that kind of life? I think it's important to um, I might offer this as like why we should be judging people not just on what they're morally responsible for, but based on sort of the objective value of their characteristics is because if we don't do that, even if it's they have those characteristics or they have that life through no fault of their own, if we didn't make those judgments, then we wouldn't be able to understand tragedy when it actually happens. So when someone has unfortunate circumstances that befall them, if we're like, well, we can't judge it because it wasn't their fault then we wouldn't be able to understand how to have compassion for that or what should we do to try to improve their situation if we feel we do have a moral obligation to care about them so uh, virtue the virtue third here of this picture is doing some important work here it, it's in it's contributing um, and maybe set some context for how to understand these things without being this determining condition on them okay you can be an egalitarian and support virtue ethics. There's, there's no logical contradiction there. If you still have some questions about that, um, I'd be very interested in helping you work that stuff out. Uh, I hope my little description here has been clear. Uh, if anyone in the chat is not sure uh, if they've got the full picture or picking up what I'm throwing down, please let me know. I'd like to clarify that as much as possible, but I think this is important so we don't go into Aristotle framing him as doing something that he's not doing and maybe thus misunderstanding this theory and what its what its ambitions are. But this is a little change of pace from Mill and Kant, who are really concerned about moral duty and justice and things like that. Even, even Mill is concerned about justice, um, doing what's right. And Aristotle is thinking about um, the right action in, in a kind of like detached from moral responsibility kind of way and that that can be a little bit of a switch right to turn off the moralizing aspect of this but just to think about what conditions are ideal um, something else that I think might be helpful here uh, is imagining putting yourself in the shoes of a parent who has a child and you're like you want the best for your child what is that picture you know what kind of life would, would you hope for for them um, which is going to include external circumstances but probably and especially if not centrally what's happening for them internally how their character is developed um, what kind of person they are is going to be a big part of whether their life is an ideal one an example of human life at its very best okay so let's get started um, if you want to follow along people in the chat my Aristotle lecture notes I think are useful here. I'm going to be pulling them up on the screen for all the YouTube people, but you might also want to pull it up. Um, and again, you can find that in the file section of Canvas. I'm going to be picking up on the second half of the first page because there's, for the sake of time here, we're not going to be doing everything. Um, but I'm going to start here with the kind of square one for um, how Aristotle is approaching this whole question. And there's one super central, I would say, theoretical axiom that is the square one for Aristotle. And it's the idea that good is not a intrinsic property all on its own. You can't say this thing is good. It has the property of being good. Aristotle's like, that makes no sense. That's unintelligible. He argues that to understand logically what it means to say something is good, conceptually requires, logically requires, some judgment of what that thing's function is. That I don't understand whether something is good until I already have a judgment about what is its function. What is it good for? So for example, let's do something really simple, like um, a table or this cup. Is this a good cup? Well, it depends on what are cups good for. What is the proper function of a cup? 
if it's to hold liquid in it um, in a way that it doesn't spill and is messy and is something I can drink out of, that it's the contents are accessible to me, like a, uh, a tin can is a bad cup. <laughs> it's good for something else. You know, it has its own function, preserving food um, for long periods of time. But for a cup, it's got to be accessible. This is a good cup. Don't have liquid spilling all over me. Have ready access to them. This is a good cup. If I say it's a good cup, it's because I can say that because I know what a cup is good for. Uh, what about a bad cup? Well, a bad cup might have a hole or like a crack and like liquid is coming out of it all the time. That's a bad cup. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. For Aristotle, as opposed to these other theories we've been looking at, there isn't a universal pattern for goodness other than this idea of goodness derives from proper functioning. Aristotle thinks for every type of thing, it has its own type of good. So the standards for a good table or don't need to be the same as the standards for a good cup or a good human. And that's the real object of study that we're focused on here. What's a good human? What are the characteristics of a properly functioning human? I mean, really for Aristotle, uh, good human versus bad human, like how, what we're judging, what, we're, what we mean when we say those things, really comes down to properly functioning human versus malfunctioning human. Um, maybe uh, some of you are familiar with this kind of language from kind of like a therapy context or a psychological context. My partner's a therapist, so I, we talk about this. And I've always been interested in psychology. I almost became a therapist myself. Um, it's always something I've thought about. Uh, so this language is very familiar to me. But when you have like um, coping mechanisms for dealing with like distress or painful experiences, you can have maladaptive um, or dysfunctional coping mechanisms that maybe help with dealing with something, but also make so many other messes along the way, um, like self-destructive behavior, other dis destructive behavior is like a way of processing certain types of emotional experiences, but they're really messy and cause other kinds of problems. So they're kind of performing a function, but they're also kind of malfunctional. They're not doing it in the excellent way. And for Aristotle, a good person is like a properly, excellently functioning person. Now, the big thing is going to be picking out what are the functions of a human. And stay tuned on that. Aristotle's got a lot of interesting things to say about that. That's where it's going to go next. But this first big idea is that goodness derives from functions. And Aristotle observes how functions can be linked with each other. We do this function in order for this end and that's to, for some other end and so on and so forth. That distinction you've heard before from Mill and from Kant, it's this distinction about means and ends. Something valuable for the sake of something else, like a hypothetical imperative, or something valuable for its own sake, intrinsically valuable, like a categorical imperative makes a judgment about that. So something done for its own sake or for the sake of something else. And Aristotle's thinking, all these other goods, they're like leading somewhere. What's that chief good? What's the ultimate end of human life? Not the contingent ones, um, but what, what's the sort of ultimate function here? And it's not going to be a reductive model. It's going to be a pluralistic one. So we're going to see that. Um, so there's some other fun stuff here in this early section, like the second half of, of page one of my lecture notes here. But um, yeah, let me say a couple things here. So uh, the human good is not um, even necessarily going to be like the dolphin good. So like for Kant, he was creating a moral theory that he's like, this applies to anyone who is an agent, who has the capacity to be self-determining. He thinks the moral law is universal and unconditional in that sort of sense. Aristotle's approach is much more contingent when he's talking about just what the good state is for a thing depends on its nature. And what things, what functions it, nature allows it to be able to possibly perform, what possible functions it has. So um, dolphins use echolocation. They could be skilled at that or unskilled at that. I don't have that capacity. I, I mean, actually, we do have very small abilities at echolocation. It's been discovered, but um, it's not a very robust thing. And I definitely can't do it at the level of skill a dolphin can. So that wouldn't be a part of the human good, but it might be a part of the dolphin good. Aristotle's really big on using function and purpose and projects as a basis for understanding things in nature. This is called a teleological model. Teleology is having the logic of purposes and functions. 
Um, and it, there's one of Aristotle's legacies is actually something that modern evolutionary biology uses. The, you may have heard of binomial nomenclature of like defining um, animals into uh, genus and species and animal kingdoms and all that sort of stuff. And how we oftentimes split these things up and decide this is a new species is based on the functions of organisms that have certain traits. So part of how we identify their nature is in reference to their functioning and what functions they're capable of. The, the story is a little more complicated since Aristotle, of course. Um, modern biology is more nuanced and there's some other factors people use for making choices about speciesization. Um, but it all, all, it really is very much in the spirit of what Aristotle's up to. And when it comes to the ethics, he's doing very similar kind of game. Okay, now uh, Aristotle, uh, if you have taken a look at the Nicomachean Ethics, you might have noticed tonally and stylistically it's a little different than Kant and Mill. Um, Kant and Mill both had concerns about intuition and how trustworthy was it as evidence for normative claims. Aristotle is much more comfortable appealing to intuitions, although he's still critical of them. And how he usually approaches a philosophical question is he's like, before we get super fancy with all this like intellectualism and theoretical complexity, he's like, let's just, how do people normally answer this question? So if you ask people, what's the chief good? What's the human good? What's the, the ultimate end of life? What's the meaning of life, basically? You might get answers like this the life of consumption that focuses on pleasure or the life of action which focuses on honor or the life of reflection which focuses on understanding and wisdom and knowledge these are like major answers that people give Aristotle rejects the first two and then leaves the third one hanging to be returned to later about the sort of philosophy life he talks about this at the very end of the book or uh, very end of the Nicomachean ethics in book 10 um, and we'll, we'll maybe return to that as well. But the life of action or honor is particularly noteworthy here. Um, this is definitely the uh, culture of his time. Athens being a democracy, the culture was all about civic engagement. Like your status and, and like how it reflected on you as a person is like how much of like a mover and shaker are you in politics? How much are you influencing... Um, what's going on here, doing actions that are to be honored, um, that make an impact. Um, it's still present very much today. Um, there's a lot of that kind of culture that's a part of American life, um, especially in the context of justice and social justice, of like having, uh, dedicating your life or at least a significant portion of it toward trying to make the world a better place or deal with problems in it. Um, or just in the business world, like being a being a big deal. <laughs> and Aristotle's got some interesting arguments about why that kind of go countercultural to his own time about why that's not the end of human life. Um, mostly the, the really interesting one is that it's a kind of circular thing that to just pursue honor on its own is superficial because that's just based on the whims and preferences of other people. So like being a, a pandering populist demagogue is not really something meaningful, Aristotle argues. Um, it's like being a, a pop musician who's like a fad for a day and then they're forgotten, right? And it's not anything about a credit to them. It's really just about other people and what's happening with them that is the basis of whether they're honored. But Aristotle says, you know, the people I can have respect for are the people who are not looking to pursue popularity at any cost, but are the people who want to deserve to be honored, that they want to be a person who it would be legitimate and appropriate for people to honor but then he says, that's just passing the buck. The whole point of trying to figure out what's eudaimon or what is praiseworthy is to figure out what would make you deserving of praise and to say, well, what would make you deserving of praise or an example of human life at its very best is to be worthy of praise, to be an example of human life. That's a circular answer. So he's like, we'd have to get deeper on this anyway and investigate what would be the basis that would make you deserving of honor or for people to remember you with respect or to have a legacy or all the things that ancient Greece is obsessed about. Um, and then the life of pleasure is against hedonism. Um, so this is another big reason why Aristotle is not a utilitarian. Um, and his, when he's talking about hap what's translated as happiness, it's not what we, what we probably hear when we hear the word happiness. Okay, so Aristotle looks at some of those answers and then is like, well, some of these have problems with them, so we're going to have to dig deeper. 
But one interesting thing about why he even entertains these in the first place is not to set up some straw men, but he's going to actually take those answers he thinks actually fail and incorporate them into his answer. Um, so he thinks there's actually something that people are getting at with their intuitions that actually is relevant for human virtue. So let's take a look at his... Um, oh, uh, one little detail I forgot. Um, so uh, let's go back to... Um, uh, good inanimate objects, like a good table. Good table holds things up at a convenient height for easy access. Like a, a one-inch table off the ground is bad. A table that's built like this is bad because things slide off it. Once you know that, then you can think about other sorts of functions. Like, who's a good carpenter? Carpenter has the function of making tables and chairs and things like that. So how would you tell a good carpenter? Well, if they're able to make good tables. And once you know what good tables are, you can figure out what good carpenters are. And that's starting to get us into the world of human action and human functions. But Aristotle's like, yeah, but being a good carpenter is a really specialized role. And people are more than just carpenters. There's a lot more to life than just that. So when he's looking for the human good, eudaimonia, the chief good of the meaning of life, it's got to be something that's not just so limited. It's got to take into account all of a person. So with that in mind, let's take a look at uh, his definitions here. Chat, how are you doing? Uh, is anything popping up? I've been talking for a while now, uh, like 45 minutes. How are, how are you doing with Aristotle so far? And if you don't have the Aristotle lecture notes, I do recommend grabbing them to be able to follow along here. Thanks, Leticia. Letting me know. Positive feedback's helpful. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, do you have the lecture notes up and easy access? Anyone need a minute or so to grab it? So I'm picking up here on the top of page two of the lecture notes. Um, the heading here is evaluation via ends dash uh, 1.7. Um, and I'm first, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the excellent best ends just yet. I want to talk about the formula for eudaimonia that's in the box. So to read it out, it is activity of soul done via reason in accordance with the excellent life. And then Aristotle adds to that another condition uh, that refers to the necessity of the relevant resources that are needed to manifest that excellence, to perform those actions. So th this is Aristotle's story, uh, his ultimate sort of rubric for what human life at its very best looks like. A lot of the um, content of the, the meaningfulness of this formula comes from the condition about the excellent life, but hang on to that if you're wondering about that kind of blank check, we'll talk about that in a second. But let's talk about the other three conditions and what they're contributing here to Aristotle's vision. Um, when it comes to the activity of soul thing, Aristotle is saying um, the, the soul, the activity of soul is like the animus, uh, um, which I, I talked about a little bit with Kant, I think, um, that Kant's conception of the will is very much like this ancient Greek conception of the animus. It's whatever's in you that gets you to act. Like, you're not like a table. You're not an inert object. The human good is going to have reference to the fact that you're a thing that does things. Um, so in order to be <clears throat> an example of human life at its very best, you have to actually do something. Now, why is that necessary to talk about? The contrast here would be with um, something like how we might think about virtue as just being a skill or ability. And Aristotle is saying, who really cares if you've got the ability if you never use it? So use, I'll use this illustration for a couple of these things. Imagine a, um, a painter. Or like, is this person a good painter or not? And they might have uh, all this incredible ability, like their innate gifts to be painting excellent paintings, to make beautiful works of art. is just off the charts. But if they never actually paint any paintings, 
We can't hold them up as like an example of painters at their very best. This is not as ideal as the painter who not only has the skill, but actually enacts it, manifests it, puts it out there into reality. That is going to be even more excellent. So people can't, for, for Aristotle, he'd have a lot of objection to someone who's just like, well, I know what I'm capable of, so, so I'm pretty awesome and virtuous. And so I'll be like, get off your butt, start doing some stuff with that skill. Like, you got the skill, how can you neglect it? How can you fail to actually manifest it in the world? Um, if so, then we'd be like, well, it's better to have the skill than to not have the skill, but what does it really matter if you're not using it? Something Aristotle repeatedly says in the Nicomachean Ethics when he's talking about a philosophical inquiry into ethics, and I, I think I've mentioned this in class before in passing, he's like, we don't want to have knowledge of the good just to have the knowledge of it. The whole reason of having the knowledge of the good is so you can live it. Philosophy that's not lived is kind of pointless. I mean, Aristotle's not going to go completely pointless. He's got some things to say about how philosophy is really enjoyable to do and all this other stuff. But, um, but that is a main concern for him. That he's like, knowledge of the good doesn't make you into an ideal person. Living it is, is the key. So that's the activity of soul part. You got to be manifesting the excellence, not just have it in capacity. How about this done by a reason thing? Well, there's a couple things that are going to be said about this. The, the significance of reason. First off, this reason is not the kind of thing that Kant has concern about, about like actions get their moral worth based on the reason or how reasoning is the basis of autonomy and freedom for Kant. Don't inject that into Aristotle. Reason is just one of these central features of what it is to be a person. It's one of these functions that is kind of a part of everything. So it, it makes us what we are. We're rational beings. So if good is defined by function, that there's a good based on the different type of thing, then reason's going to factor in pretty significantly here. But it's not just its own function amongst others. It's actually, by putting this condition in as the basic, uh, as part of the basic formula for, for being your daimon, for being an excellent person and living the excellent life, he's saying this is actually relevant to every excellence. That it's better... Uh, it, doing the right thing, like acting the right way, the way that is consistent with the excellent life, is a good thing. But it's even more excellent if it's done knowingly and intentionally. In other words, you're not just doing the thing that happens to be the right or best thing to do. But you know that it's the best, and you do it for that reason. So you do it with foreknowledge and for the sake of it being the good. Um, that's really important for virtue for Aristotle. Um, <clears throat> someone who is, let's just say, let's imagine someone who is kind of, uh, in the virtue sense, born with the silver spoon in their mouth. They just naturally have all the right psychological characteristics for acting in the proper or best way. Aristotle would say, nah, that's not an example of human life at its best. The one thing that they lack is their understanding that the way that they're acting uh, naturally is the good and to pursue it for that reason rather than just on impulse that might have some echoes with Kant here but again try to take the moralizing of what Kant's analysis is out of this equation and just say you know what would be objectively better what would, would you rather have a human who's doing everything right um, because they've just kind of been brainwashed into that or trained into that um, although training will be important for Aristotle or would it be better to have someone who does all the right things, but also knows what they're doing and chooses them because they are good? That seems to add extra excellence. It makes it more praiseworthy. Here's a really silly illustration that maybe gets the point across pretty well. Take, um, uh, maybe some of you don't know about fighting video games like Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat or all these things. Um, my, my partner and I, back when I was in grad school, one of our traditions for a while was to play some Marvel versus Capcom before bed every night. Um, but these are 2D fighters. It's a video game. They're, you press buttons to make them do certain types of moves, and when they beat each other up enough, then like one person wins. It's like boxing uh, like a, a, in a video game format. Um, so uh, a lot of times these games are fairly complicated. That there a, a particular sequence of button inputs is needed to pull off some special moves. 
one of the reasons my partner and I like to play Marvel vs. Capcom is that you don't really have to be good to do something. You can kind of button mash. You can just like press a bunch of buttons, sort of timing it, and every once in a while you do something like really cool and flashy and it's fun. So we were not skilled 2D fighter players or anything. We get competitive about it, but we weren't skilled enough, right? But let's take these take a couple scenarios here. Let's say I'm doing the button mashing, and lo and behold, I press the right buttons to do the perfect move at the perfect time that wins me the match. Did I do the excellent thing? Yeah. Yep, and I achieved the excellent result. Um, but this doesn't seem very praiseworthy. It might be somewhat praiseworthy, and I, we might posture like, ha, ah, I beat you, whatever. Right. But I don't really seem to deserve it. Um, and not in a moralized sense here, not in a sense of moral responsibility, just like it's not as ideal. I don't really have the skill of playing this game well, even though I just beat someone. I just clean their clock or something, right? Um, contrast that with a situation where I'm playing the fighting game and I'm like focusing on what's happening. And I'm like, oh, that they're in the perfect position here that if I do this move, then I'll be able to win. And then I do it press those buttons and because I know the button inputs to make the move happen and then I pull it off and I win the match that seems more excellent more praiseworthy because I knew what I was doing and I chose it that way so these first two conditions about what Aristotle has as activity of soul done via reason is really kind of about our contribution toward realizing the excellent life we have to be involved we have to be active and we have to be doing it with understanding um, in order to be an example of human life at its very best. But this is where we need to talk about this third condition, about the necessity of the relevant resources. In many ways, uh, Aristotle is inspired by um, some other ancient philosophers, uh, the Stoics. And we'll talk about them more with one of the other conditions that is the next part of this lecture. But the Stoics were, I mean, if I was going to sum up Stoic ethics in a couple sentence nutshell, I would say that the Stoics are, they, they say, if you want to live well, first, recognize what's within your control versus what's not within your control. Second step, focus only on what's in your control and don't worry about all this other stuff. So like Stoics are always saying things like, you can't control the opinions of other people, so don't even try. If you're trying, you're just going to get frustrated and suffer and that's not where your attention should be focused. You should be focused on yourself, your own beliefs, your own values, your own actions and behavior. That's what's within your control. And that's what can constitute your virtue. So there, there's kind of this really austere, I mean, the austereness of Stoicism. Stoics are not unemotional. Uh, there's, that's kind of a cartoon image of them. And when we say Stoicism in this metaphorical, poetic sense, you know, it has that connotation. But really, the Stoics are about self-control they're about being responsible for yourself you can't control everything else that's going on in the world you can only play the hand that you're dealt so focus on that don't think about the things that are you don't have influence on um, and Aristotle's got a little bit of that but in learning this third condition he's not going full stoic this is actually a kind of critique of stoicism Aristotle's saying if you're gonna achieve this excellent and if you're gonna have the best life that's not something that, like the Stoic uh, ideal of someone who's just got this like shitty life but has this inner virtue that shines through because they're still doing everything right even though there are unfavorable circumstances around them. Aristotle's like, that's not an example of human life at its very best. It would be better if it wasn't like that. Because even though the Stoic saint might have the capacity to do this stuff, their circumstances don't let them manifest it. Aristotle's like, there's always going for any excellence like that's going to be a part of the excellent life which we still haven't talked about yet but for anything that you're going to achieve there to have the good life any virtue that you're going to possess is going to be in some way dependent not just on what you're up to but what the world is up to it's sort of there's an interaction between you and the world that then creates virtue um, we might put this informally today as like everyone needs help and support um, people can't just purely pull themselves up from their bootstraps, even though American cultural imagination is very fond with that image of just like, I got nothing, I come from nothing, and I made myself completely into the person I am. Aristotle's like, no, that's not what happens. 
Although there is a concession Aristotle has to this bootstraps thing, but he's he's got this kind of middle way path in between. It has everything to do with you versus has nothing to do with you. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, but there is this sort of ineliminable aspect of what the world contributes, favorable circumstances. So by resources, we don't just mean money, but just any kind of external circumstances that are favorable for you being able to realize your excellence. So as a really quick example, let's go back to the painter, the excellent painter. Um, they have the skill and they have the intention to act on it, but they can't act on it. They're not gonna be able to paint beautiful paintings if they don't have brushes and paints and canvases. They're going to need those resources. One of Aristotle's favorite virtues is friendship. Uh, friendship is a huge deal for Aristotle. And friendship is this like, uh, for him, it's a matter of being committed to the virtue of another person. So if we are friends, then we have this mutual investment in each other being good. And we help support each other in doing it. And that's like the basis of the relationship is improving each other, wanting what's best for each other and being invested in that. But you can't exhibit that virtue if there's no one around. If you're Robinson Crusoe on a desert island, like all by yourself, like you don't have any people to exhibit that virtue with. It doesn't mean you lack the ability, but this isn't the most perfect ideal manifestation of a human life. It's a better to have a human life where you have people in it and you can live that virtue out. So even the presence of a person is like a resource to be able to create excellence. Um, so we're, it's a very expanded notion of resources here, any kind of favorable circumstance, or maybe even it, it could be as minimal as not some really terrible, tragic circumstance befalling you, that you aren't in that position, that it's all this stuff from the world is about fate, basically, luck, um, favorable circumstances. So Aristotle's like that, there's always that component going on with the achievement of excellence, but Aristotle does say, that what's even more praiseworthy is needing them in a minimal way. It's not like more resources is always better. Um, take con Let's do another contrasting case here. So this is part of the special language here about the necessity of the relevant resources is what's needed. Just the things that are absolutely the minimal necessary. Okay. So imagine someone who um, ha has had a bad Bad, they drew the bad straw in terms of like which body they were born in, what circumstances they were born in. Abusive parents, um, oppressive societal conditions, poverty, all, all no favorable circumstances are going their way. If they develop themselves into a virtuous person that can realize excellence, I mean, that's amazing and very praiseworthy for Aristotle. They're still going to need some help. There's going to have to be some favorable circumstances, but they would be more excellent or more of an example of human life at its very best than someone who was born with a silver spoon in their mouth and had all of the resources and advantages to cultivate these virtues over the course of their development. Um, for Aristotle, that's not as excellent. Um, now, Aristotle in some other places says some other things that are kind of contradictory to this, but what he usually says is something like, well, if you had more resources, then you can realize more excellence. So getting more resources is kind of good. But it's still, it, it, the condition on it has to be like only to the extent that those are necessary to make something else happen. Okay? So um, that's part of his concession to the kind of stoic stuff or the bootstrapping stuff is that, uh, yeah, you're going to need some resources, but the minimal amount that you can get by with, right? That's what's actually ideal. And uh, that you can still achieve those heights of excellence okay so now there's one other really huge part of the formula we got to talk about and that's this part of uh that all this what you're doing the activity of soul done by reason what the world is contributing with the resources all those are working together uh in accordance with achieving the excellent life okay so what is the excellent life all right let's go back to good via function so Aristotle doesn't think that an ideal human life is that of a specialist, which is kind of interesting given our contemporary social environment, where because of the circumstances of the job market and how the economy works and all that kind of stuff, that you kind of need to be really awesome at one thing to be competitive. 
But in the words of Major Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell, any of you anime fans out there, she says in the movie, uh, over-specialize and you breed in weakness. And Aristotle would love that. He's like, to be a good person is not a matter of performing one function well. Humans are more than that. The human good is, we're, we're a multifunctional object. I like to relate it to um, the metaphor of a Swiss army knife. So if, if a good thing depends on performing its function well, tables and cups have pretty simple functions, maybe a couple of subtleties to them, but like a Swiss army knife has a lot of functions. There's a lot of tools in it. And if you're going to have a good Swiss army knife or an example of a Swiss army knife at its very best, like the Udaimon Swiss army knife, <clears throat> all of its functions have to be good. They all have to be excellent. I don't know about you. I've had a couple Swiss Army knives, and none of them have been this Udaimon Swiss Army knife. There's always some thing in them that's just kind of useless or doesn't really do its job, its intended purpose. Like, the can opener has never really worked for me. <laughs> the tweezers are too weak. The scissors don't have any leverage power. I mean, but a really good Swiss Army knife would be able to perform all those functions well. Humans have a ton of possible functions and skills that we're capable of. So whatever, you know, this initial theoretical level, the excellent life is one in which you're doing everything great. This is kind of like the, you may have heard the word like renaissance man or, or we should say renaissance person. Um, someone who's not jack of all trades, master of a nun, but is master of all. Right, that they perf they do all these things excellently. Um, not to get on a huge tangent here, but um, a liberal arts education is actually a derivative of Aristotle's vision of virtue. That a liberal arts education won't allow you to only take classes in a specialized field. That that's the only thing you're planning on doing. If you go to a liberal arts university, they'll make you take classes in all sorts of other fields that you're not planning on majoring in. They're and it's mandatory to do so because they think that a well-rounded education is actually making you into a better person. It's not just a matter of college as training you for a job, but is in trying to make a better human. And that's what Aristotle's talking about here too. So you gotta be able to do everything good. But you might immediately be like balking at that because you're like, how can anyone do that? There, how can you be an excellent physicist, painter, much less like parent, and student or teacher or politician or and you know every philosopher everything like it's just it's, there's not the possibility of doing all this stuff all the trade crafts you know you just there's no way so aristotle recognizes that and he's like yeah whatever is this picture of the excellent life you can't just say do it all perfectly that's impossible pragmatically you don't have the time to do that but also even if you did have all the time, it doesn't seem like all these things should be deserving of the same importance or priority. Some stuff's going to be more central to building out the vision of the excellent life. Other stuff's going to be more secondary, tertiary, way out there. Not, maybe not that big of a deal. Here's a good simple demonstration of the expansiveness of human functioning and how far it goes, how much of a Swiss Army knife we are. Would you say, I'm sure you would, that it is a possible function of a human being to be able to burp the Star Spangled Banner. Something humans can do. It's a possible function. It's connected with our natures. Um, do I need to be a really... Do I need to do it just a bang-up rendition of the Star Spangled Banner by burping in order to be an excellent human for Aristotle? The answer is no. That's absurd. It's silly. Uh, is it a function of humans? Sure. How much of a contribution does that make to making you into an ideal human or a praiseworthy human life or something like that? No, not at all. So there's going to be some priorities here. But the next big question is, okay, how are you going to discriminate there? How do you decide what to give priority to? And Aristotle is going to give us some help. But the overall picture here is going to be this kind of patchwork quilt of other excellences, other goods um, that you are able to achieve, that you have skill in achieving and living out and manifesting. Um, in your life. So uh, let's talk about the criteria for which one should be getting central importance. And going back to the lecture notes here, again, still at the top of page two, um, 
we've got this uh, list of criteria, or if you want to use a really fancy word, a desiderata, uh, conditions for what the excellent or best ends are. The, these are like um, the measuring sticks or standards that Aristotle wants to propose for how to discriminate between these different excellences and deciding what to prioritize and what to deprioritize. And let's talk about them one by one. Some of these are easy to confuse with each other, but let, let's focus on it. So completeness first here. Um, a good is complete if it is intrinsically valuable, basically. It's going back to the means and sort of stuff, like something valued for its own sake or valued for the sake of something else. Um, so the things that are the excellences that should be at the center are those excellences which we value for their own sake. Um, and so, and maybe you notice a pattern here, all these ethicists don't think of your ability to make money or possess it or have it as really being a central thing of importance. It's not, it's not what your meaning of life should revolve around. Um, definitely saw that with Mill. It's going to be true with Kant too, because Kant is like it's all about the goodwill and being self-determining and rational, and money is not involved with that. Um, although it can be an extension of your ability to live it out. No, well, I don't want to get on that tangent. Um, there's some interesting stuff there, but let's keep focused here, Tim. <laughs> um, but for Aristotle, like the the excellence of like being able to generate profit is not a complete good. Um, that's good for the sake of other things. So let's say someone's motive for wanting to make money is to be able to support their family. Well, it's being a good parent, right? That would be um, the ultimate excellence there. Like that's the real end of it. Whether you're doing that. And that might involve something like having that that ability or that, to be able to hold down a job, right, and collect a paycheck to make that happen. But that's it. Everything else is about how you can do in that relationship, all things considered, which is going to involve a whole lot of other virtues that are also themselves going to be more complete as well. But whatever are the ultimate ends of life um, that are valued for their own sake, those are going to be things that are going to take a higher priority. Um, and so there is this kind of linking of stuff. But Aristotle's not trying to force it into like one ultimate good, something that everything reduces to, like in utilitarianism. Um, like for the utilitarian, the ultimate virtue or excellence is being able to maximize utility, right? Making that happen. That's the core function. But for Aristotle, he really think about this pluralistically. He actually says in the reading, um, let's inquire after chief goods. If they are one, then it is one. If they are many, then it is many. He's like, we don't need to prejudge that. Let's just figure out what they are, and whatever they are, however many there are, that's how many there will be. Maybe it'll be one, maybe it'll be many. But at this point, um, it's many, okay? But maybe in a hierarchy. But he's kind of loose with this. Um, then we get to self-sufficiency. So self-sufficiency is very easily confused with completeness. And the lecture notes here, I just have a quick, these are really lecture notes. They're notes to me to explain things. But this sort of idea of worth even in isolation is, the grammar of that is very vague. And let me uh, explain it because this is very easily confused with completeness, for one. We all have to talk about that. But also just with what the word self-sufficient kind of intuitively means to us. Um, Aristotle is actually very explicit about this. Even This isn't just a translation snafu or something. Um, Aristotle is like, when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about people's ability to be uh, living their life independently from other people, like on their own. This isn't about um, being self-sustaining, like a child moving out from their parents' house and being able to live on their own. That's not what self-sufficiency is about. This is uh, not about a person, but about a kind of good. And this worth even in isolation is a reference to a kind of test for how to tell which goods are self-sufficient. But if we wanted to define self-sufficiency itself directly, informally, I would describe it like this. How self-sufficient a good is, is basically how big of a splash does it make in adding value to your overall life? How much does it contribute to your overall life being a valuable one by having that excellence or that good as a part of it? And the best way to test how big of a splash it makes is to look at a life that only has that good, which is kind of hard to conceive. Like, you're doing nothing right except for that. How much would your overall life be valuable? Well, there's a lot of goods that, while they might be complete, are not going to be self-sufficient. 
Let me give you an example. Um, one complete good in my book is being good at playing board games. I seem to have got this massive library of board games behind me. I love board games. It's my main hobby outside of philosophy, which is also my job. Um, but I really like them. And when I'm talking about the excellence of, of board gaming playing is not just having them. That's like the necessary resource. You can't be good at playing board games if you have no board games to play or people to play them with. Oh, there are solitaire games. But um, I'm talking about like being good at engaging in that activity. Um, if any of you have played board games before, maybe you've played them with people that they might be good at winning, but they're really terrible people to play games with. You're like, oh, man, please hope that whoever is not at the board game night because I don't want to play a game with them anymore. They might be really good at winning, but winning is not the point of board games. It's not the function of them. There's actually a wonderful quote from a really famous board game designer named, I'm going to butcher his name, but Rainier Kinesia, I think is how you pronounce it, pretty close to that. And he says, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's, it's something like, um, uh, the, the function or the, the goal, he says, the goal of a game is to win, but it's not the purpose of playing. He's like offering advice as like a board game designer. Like, you got to make the game have something in there, some affordances for the players that's not focused around just the strategy of winning, but it's for other purposes. So someone who's a really great person to play a game with. Um, maybe someone who's, like, really bad is not so much fun. Like, it's good to have some... That you lose out on the competition thing, right? Or that they're a challenge, and there's something satisfying about having a challenge. Um, but it's not just about whether they can win. Um their graciousness, that they have fun with it, that they make it fun. Um, there's all these other things that we could talk about that make for a good board game player. So let's say I've got that excellence, but I have no other excellences. I have no other virtues. I have no other skills. Just that. That's that the only thing that's going good for me in my life. That's a pretty sad life. That's why this is just my hobby. It's just this thing I do on the side for fun. Um, there's meaning and value in it. I could talk all day about the cool stuff about board games um, and why I think they're a valuable part of human life. But they don't make that big of a splash, ultimately. All things considered, compared to other things, no. But here's something else that might do it. You, I mean, you might be despairing, like, is there anything that in isolation could make your life worth living and make it a meaningful life? Well, Aerosol is not saying that there's some one thing that if you have that, it's that's the best. Because, of course, you need to have lots of them, right? That would be better than just one. But when we're trying to figure out, like, how much of a contribution does this one make? If you put it in isolation, and it, if that's all you had, it still would make your life, like, minimally valuable and meaningful and worth living, then that's a pretty big deal. It should be giving a more privileged status in building out this patchwork quilt of the excellent life, painting that vision. And here's an example of something I think might fit the bill. Imagine two people who are in a lifelong partnership kind of thing, like maybe a marriage, maybe not. doesn't have to be. Um, but they're just killing it. Like they are excellent partners with each other. They have the most ideal relationship that two humans could ever have. On all the, the things that are challenges and complexities of like doing relationships right, they're nailing it. But everything else in their life sucks. They have, they're totally uneducated. They have no artistic sensibilities. They live in total poverty. They don't have any other relationships with anyone else. They don't have any influence in society. They can't hold down jobs. Like, blah, all the rest of it, nothing going. They still might, at, let's say they're at the end of their life, and they're talking, and they're, like, reflecting on their life, and they're like, man, our life was full of a lot of shitty things. Like, a lot of lack of opportunities and other things that are good that just we didn't have. But the fact that I got to spend it with you, this relationship, made it a life worth living, and I, would, I wouldn't trade that for the world, right? That kind of sentiment. Like, I would do it all over again. Um, this wasn't a life I resent living. This was meaningful and valuable, and I was happy to have this life with you. I mean, it's kind of a, like awe, like romantic type of sentiment. But there, there could be some really good basis for them saying that with a, with a good like that, with an excellence like that in their life. Could it be better? Sure. But their life is a meaningful one because of that excellence being present in it. So that says something. That says something about how central 
that kind of virtue or that kind of excellence should be and the priority we should have in developing ourselves to have that excellence. That's how, that's how this self-sufficiency criterion works out. Okay. Um, how are we doing so far, chat? I'm, I'm making sense. I haven't seen any questions pop up, so I'm just checking in. Self-sufficiency is a little weird. I hope my examples and illustrations helped. No replies. Okay. I, I hope things are going well. I'm going to keep moving so that we can get this video over soon. Um, okay. So two more things to talk about here. Unique human function and stability. So the unique human function, I'm not going to say too much about this. This is an artifact of Aristotle's systematic philosophy in general. Like I was saying, he's always categorizing things in the world in, in accordance with their function. And especially unique functions are like a thing that he definitely is going to make a special category for. And Aristotle believes reason is the thing that makes humans different. Other people don't have that going on. Or, or not other people, uh, other like animals or inanimate objects that just don't have the rational function. So that was, that's what makes us special. And if it's something, if it's a special function, if it's a unique function, Aristotle thinks it should get more priority. I don't think this argument is very good or this standard is not one that we should be leaning on a whole lot um, because I don't think reason is unique to humans. I think dolphins have it for sure and, and maybe some other animals too. And I think if Aristotle knew that, he wouldn't really change his mind about the significance of reason. Uh, there's, there's other arguments to be made. We've already talked about some of them. I mean, he puts reason right there in the core rubric for excellence. Um, and it's not based on just that it's a unique function. Burping the Star Spangled Banner is a unique human function, but I don't think that makes it deserving of higher priority in the excellent life. So that, that standard probably is not as a big of a deal. But stability is huge. So in the lecture notes, I call it um, not vulnerable or fragile. It has limited contingency. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is definitely the nod to Stoicism. Um, I think this is, this is a way in which Stoicism is rubbed off on Aristotle a little bit. Um, but it's also just the heck of a good standard on, all on its own. What Aristotle is saying is those excellences which require more from the world in terms of that minimal necessity in order to achieve them are not as important as the ones that require less from the world. And his reason for this is that the more that the world is needed to create the excellence, then if the excellence happens, that's more of a credit to the circumstances rather than a credit to the person. If it's less dependent on the world cooperating, then whether you have it or not is really up to what's going on with you. It makes you praiseworthy, not in the moral sense again, but just as like an example of human life at its very best. So um, if there's concerns about elitism with Aristotle, like not everyone's going to be able to be eudaimon for Aristotle because of circumstance. People won't have the opportunities. Maybe they should have the opportunities. It would be better for them to have those opportunities, but some people are just not going to have them. Um, if that happens, it's no fault of theirs, but we can't treat that as an example of human life at its very best. Like I said before, that would eliminate our ability to understand that there's a tragedy going on, that there's something bad that would need to be corrected, right? Um, that we'd want to make those opportunities available to them. And this is this the stability criteria Aristotle emphasizes a lot in his in his if you read the whole book it's like it shows up a lot and it's a thing that I think kind of resists elitism Aristotle is saying that the things that ultimately matter are things that don't require very contingent circumstances in order to achieve a really really good example of this is the modern uh, focus on accessibility and education that what really matters is getting certain type of knowledge, not a certain way in which you make that happen. Um, so when people talk about alternative uh, learning styles and having a class that uh, approaches students in different ways and gives them different ways in order to succeed at something, that'd be something Aristotle would be completely on board with. It's not that you are able to achieve this knowledge in a very particular or rigid or you know, focused way, but it's the knowledge that actually is the thing that matters. And we should think about that because that isn't limited by these very specific contingencies. I mean, there's certain styles of school that work more for some people rather than others, right? And trying to do everything that you can to create alternative pathways for students being able to achieve that knowledge is, uh, would, be, would be this kind of respect for the stability thing. Make the right priority, right? 
um, a certain style of education might be more limiting for certain people because of their circumstances, right? But the education maybe can be more universal than that, that it's more accessible, it's more stable, it has limited contingency. So we should try to find a way to promote that. Now, there, there, that doesn't mean, I mean, I could, maybe I shouldn't get distracted on a whole bunch of pedagogy about accessible education here too, but there's certain things that maybe can only be achievable in certain ways, and then it wouldn't be right to do it a different way because then you're not giving people the opportunity to develop that kind of virtue or excellence or have that good in their lives. Um, but in, in as much as it's possible to make something not as contingent as is possible, the stability criteria gives a mandate to that. So a lot of things that we do to, when people get judgmental about each other, and there's like a pecking order of like who's better and who's worse, a lot of times I notice that we do it based on factors that are really contingent about people's circumstances that separate them from other people. But Aristotle's saying the stuff that's the most important for whether or not you're a good person living the excellent life are not those things. They're the things that are more accessible that are available to everybody. This is one of his reasons for, at the very end of the book, talking about why the philosophical life is so good. Because it isn't something elitist. It, it actually is something that you can participate in regardless of your circumstances. You don't have to be wealthy to be a good philosopher. Knowledge is available to be found everywhere. Aristotle's not thinking about education as like being able to pay for really good schools or something. He's talking about the investment in life reflectively developing your rational abilities. That's something you can do everywhere, all the time, if you focused on it. And especially with the internet available, you can read lots of excellent philosophy without having to pay for a school or something like that. But he thinks that that's something, I, I've uh, sometimes tell this anecdotal story about, a, I was hanging around in Ballard waiting to meet up with some friends and there was a person experiencing homelessness who was like stacking stones and then struck up a conversation and we shared a cigarette. Um, and turned out he has a philosophy PhD, and he was, and uh, we had a conversation for probably like two hours. I actually lost track of what I was doing that day from because I was talking with him. Um, and he's someone I think of when I read Aristotle. Of like, he's still doing it. I mean, he's living that excellence even though his circumstances don't give him a lot of other opportunities. He he can still do that. Um, he can still participate in that kind of thing, even at, even in those circumstances with limited resources and opportunity. Okay, so that's Aristotle's core rubric for um, what it is to be an excellent human. And we've talked about the criteria that will be used to help flesh out this vision of what this patchwork quilt of excellences are that make up the excellent life. But that's the goal of, of humanity, is to pursue the excellent life and to do it in this particular way with these conditions. You, you have to acknowledge the world here. It's got to be cooperating to a certain extent. We have to kind of pay homage to that can't pretend like that's not a fact um, but also it's a matter of the person acting and living that out that excellent life not just having the skill or capacity and that they're doing this with knowledge and understanding and intentionality they choose to do this uh, intentionally okay um, the next big part of Aristotle that we're gonna have to talk about is how this actually happens like you said what what good is it to know what's good if you don't know how to do it if you don't know how to live it so most of Aristotle is focused on kind of some moral psychology and how to understand character building. And that's what I still have yet to talk about. This video is at two hours tonight, and for those of you in the chat with the breaks and everything, we're getting pretty late here. So I think I'm going to call this one. Um, our code word for tonight is going to be peanuts, because I still have some peanuts left over from the baseball game. Um, so that'll be the code word tonight. Peanuts is the code word for the quiz. Um, and uh, and we still have some more Aristotle to do. We're we're doing pretty good here, um, but there's there's a big chunk we have to talk about still. Um, I am sad about how we're losing another day together next week. Tuesday is a professional development day, and there won't be classes. I will probably be recording a video to get us moving because. I'm very much chomping at the bit to get to business ethics at this point. So I want to move this along. I might even give this video before, I might record another video prior to the weekend. Um, I, this, I We got to basically the same point that my class earlier today got, and I promised them, and hopefully I can fulfill this promise, I'm going to make the same promise to you, 
that to finish off Aristotle, I'm going to try to do it within 30 minutes. So I'm going to try to make a shorter video, just a, a short 30 minute video to get Aristotle wrapped up so we can just hit the ground running next week with um, Friedman uh, and, um, and our first topic, our unit on fiduciary duty. Um, if for anyone who's signed up for the early presentations, um, as we talked about, they're going to be done online. Uh, 800 word minimum you're gonna basically be writing it as a critical response paper I would just take a couple minutes here telling you give you some advice uh, advice about what the expectations are but anyone who signed up for the really early ones before they've been able to see anyone else doing stuff I really encourage you to contact me too while you're working on it um, and I'm happy to clarify things more but here's I'll leave you tonight with a brief description of what these things are what, I, what I'm looking for out of these I'm not gonna be grading these super intensely like formal academic papers. This is a derivative of what normally with a full on-campus class would happen in class. It would be like a 15-20 minute presentation in class um, where students can be as formal or as informal as they like. It's really about the ideas. And what your mandate is for this is to critically evaluate the arguments, claims, and positions of the paper that you're signed up for. So uh, first person is doing Friedman to be about Friedman. Um, you it, it, it needs to be focused on them. It's not going to be about explaining their ideas. That's my job as a lecturer here to try to explain what's going on. Um, but your job is to evaluate. And I want almost all the content to be about that. Basically, when I'm figuring out how to grade this, it's about um, density of content. So like how much substance you're providing and whether it's fulfilling this mandate, whether it's on target with evaluating. So doing as robust a critical evaluation as you can. A couple notes about this. One, a critical evaluation is not just about what you disagree with or what you take objection to. Uh, it's also about being able to identify what's of merit and what makes sense and what arguments hold water and maybe helping to explain why they're good arguments if you find them convincing. It might, if you, if you really like some of the arguments in one of these papers you're reviewing, you might try to play some devil's advocate about how would someone else maybe have concerns about it, but what could you do to help the person defend against those objections and, and uh, retain the main points that they're making. Um, but if you definitely have negative criticisms, if you disagree with stuff, definitely bring that stuff up too. But think about it like you're like a movie reviewer or something, right? And a movie critic can't just like poop on every movie that they ever see and pick out all of its flaws. They're missing part of the picture that way. This is, this is a review to try to measure and evaluate what's good and what's not so good in the philosophical efforts of the person who's put together these arguments. So that's your job. Um, there's something else here. Um, oh, right. Uh, because it's not your job to explain it and it's just to evaluate, and because these things are due um, on the day that we have planned to discuss this stuff, the same as the reading comments, um, if you have any confusions about what's going on in the paper that you're reviewing, you should talk to me. Reach out to me, talk to me ahead of time, because you're not going to have the luxury of listening to the lecture first and then writing your response. This is preemptive. And the goal is uh, partially to like get some discussion going and helping other people think through critically for themselves what they think about the paper. Like if you're doing this in the class format, which we're not, but you know what this is modeled after, we're trying to make the best with the online format here, um, is I'd have someone do the presentation orally in class and then we'd have class discussion about it. So they've kind of stepped out and been vulnerable sharing their perspective and opinion and then that might inspire other people, gives them something to bounce off of and get some more out of the rest of the class. When we're doing these posts on the discussion boards, uh, whether it's for reading comments or for the presentations, uh, the main thing I'm grading you on is your contributions to those posts. But I hope that if the spirit moves you and you find it valuable, I think it is valuable, you might engage in some conversation with people like as they share their comments and questions that, you, that might inspire some discussion. And if someone has a, a critical response paper that is getting posted for that reading, feel free to respond to that and strike up a critical conversation. I, I think that I've seen when I've taught this class before, there have been some classes that don't engage with it very much. And I think, you know, I'm not mandating it. I'm not going to put a grade on it and use that artificial 
motivator for this aspect. I'm already requiring you to do the reading comments and the presentation, so I think that's sufficient. Um, but I've, I've had some other classes that have really uh, leaned into this opportunity, and I think it's more added value for the class. It's also another modality to talk about accessible education. It's another way for you to engage with things. Um, and if that's a, a way that you enjoy and get value out of, um, then that can happen there. And uh, hearing critical responses from other people really assists you in your own critical truth-seeking efforts, too, like we've talked about with the Code of Intellectual Conduct. So, uh, oh, I should say one other thing here um, about the reading comments. So as we get through done with this crash course, we uh, are going to be starting up with the reading comment assignments. Um, so the, the, the pace of the class is going to change. You're going to start having officially assigned readings from here on out. All the stuff up to now has been optional. It seems like not many people have been reading it. But get ready for that to switch gears. There's going to be a lot of reading, and it's all mandatory. And the thing that is sort of a check on that is doing the reading comment assignments. So um, take a look at the syllabus description. I lay it all out there what I'm looking for. Um, and they are going to be due. Um, you're going to have to make those posts up on Canvas in the discussion thread for that reading. I'll make a new one for each reading. Um, that's due the day we're planning on talking about it. So whether that's a Tuesday when we're in class together or a Thursday when I'm doing these video lectures, uh, that's what it's going to look like. So if you have any other questions, if the syllabus doesn't clear it up for you, just a phone call away, contact me. Happy to clarify things more or give you direction about how to approach doing these things um, if you have any concerns about it. But there we go. And I will, uh, if chat has anything, you anything you want to ask or get into here before the end, Code word again was peanuts, just in case you forgot. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm just getting really good at giving these lectures or something, but I haven't had a lot of questions or comments from, from people in there. I hope I'm doing a good job. I, I hope this is really clear and accessible. You're getting an idea of what's happening with these theories. Um, but if, if it's not, if, if there's anything that is not clicking, um, please don't be shy about it. I, I really would love to maybe have some people break the ice a little bit more, maybe open it up for more people who are not sure about whether, you know, maybe they have questions, but they're not going to step out there because maybe other people are not doing that. Um, if, if you're a person who's comfortable speaking up or asking questions uh, in class or online here, I really invite you to do that. Um, for the sake of everyone else too, that it'll be encouraging for them. That's kind of you create a classroom atmosphere and record it this way. Um, okay, uh, fair enough, Marika. Uh, if if you other things pop up, definitely let me know. But the invitation is always there. And and if you're not comfortable talking in class or doing it in any kind of public format like on this video, um, that shouldn't stop you from reaching out to me too. I want you to get answers to your questions. I want this to make sense for you. And if you're having to struggle with that don't lose heart about it it's definitely possible for this to make sense if it's not making sense um, and we can make we can we can get there we can get where we need to be with it um, and so I encourage you to let me have the opportunity to help you with that um, okay I will say good night to you then and so long on YouTube see you folks man I'm not gonna see you in person for a week and a half at least that's sad but um, all the more reason to reach out and be in conversation with me since we're not going to get the chance to do it in person. So, hope things are going well for you, and uh, until next time.